Um, and then as you can see up here, that is our pre-training survey. So if you haven't had a chance to fill that out, I know Calendly does send that out for everybody, but um, if you haven't had the chance to fill that out, feel free to do that now, um, just as we wait for everyone else to join the class. Oops, try not to steal the presentation from me. It's all good. Um, and then we'll get started in a moment or two. Do not want transcription. Great. Awesome. Welcome, Philip. So just as we give it another moment or two, I'm just curious if anyone um, is comfortable sharing if this is a brand new training for them or have you done a training before um, in terms of administering naloxone, whether it was IM or nasal? It's brand new for me. Brand new for you. Thanks, Christy. <laughs> Always uh, brave being the first one to speak. Hopefully we get a little bit more comfortable. Katie said all new too. Brooke said all new. Okay, amazing. So it looks like it's new for lots of people. Jennifer, you unmuted yourself as well. Were you going to share? It's also new to me as well. Okay. All right. Perfect. Well, that's an awesome place to start, right? And hopefully by the end of the training today, you're leaving with, yeah, new for Philip or Philippe, if I mispronounce your name, so sorry, but um, hopefully that you're leaving the training today with um, a lot of confidence on how to respond to this emergency. So Phil, great. Um, so, so, so happy that you're here. Okay, so why don't I get us going? I'm gonna start us off for some introductions. Again, I'll leave this pre-training survey up for one more moment. So if you haven't had the chance to complete that, you just need to scan it with your phone um, and it'll take you right to uh, the survey for you to fill out really quickly. And then we'll get going into some introductions. For those who just joined the call, um, I am recording this training solely for internal training purposes. So just so you're aware, if for any reason, um, you know, you don't want that your training to be recorded, just let me know and we will, we're happy to reschedule. We have trainings running all week. Okay, so let's dive in. So first and foremost, I wanna say a really, really big welcome to everyone. So my name's Morgan, my pronouns are she and her. Welcome, Ashley. Um, and I will be the instructor for the opioid poisoning response training that you'll be taking today with St. John Ambulance. So like I just said, um, really thank you so much for being here. Thank you for carving this time out of your day. Um, and, and spending this time with me, it really is such an important and life-saving skill to have. So just really happy that you're here. Um, just a little bit about me super quickly. So like I had mentioned, this is a national program. Um, and so we have people joining from all across the country with different levels of experience, all of that. I myself am joining from Hamilton, Ontario. I have a background in mental health and disability management. I've been with St. John Ambulance um, on their opioid poisoning response training team for about a year and a half now. And prior to that, I was working with Special Olympics Ontario. Uh, but it really has been such a privilege to grow with this program. I learn something new every time I facilitate this training, and I'm sure I'll learn something new today as well. Um, as for the course itself, the content was developed by Bang Wai, and he's a social worker in Guelph, Ontario. He has a tremendous amount of experience administering naloxone and managing this type of emergency. So it's really been created with a lot of intention and a lot of heart um, through his firsthand experiences. And it's, of course, also been heavily vetted by our training steering committee and our medical team as well. So you can trust that you are in good hands here. And so my intention for you all today is to really create this as a very open forum. You know, we'll be going through the content. Of course, there's quite a lot to get through. Um, I have a few questions that I will be asking you as well, like to incorporate a little bit of discussion here and there throughout the training too. Um, but as we move through the training, if you yourself have questions or if you have, you know, a comment or a story or, you know, a different perspective that you want to bring to the table today, 
please, please know that that is more than welcome. I would love to hear your thoughts. Um, essentially, you're welcome to participate as much or as little as you feel comfortable. And so just with that in mind, I'm going to break down some of the handy tools on Teams in case you're newer to the platform that's going to help you get the most out of interacting with me and with the group. Um, so you can see at the top, if you're on the desktop, um, it should be at that top bar there. There's like um, like a black bar with a lot of different images for, for the tools. So you can see that little speech bubble there. That's the chat button. We've already um, had success in utilizing that this morning. So you can press on that and type your thoughts, your questions into the chat. If you're maybe less comfortable sharing in front of the group, if maybe you know your mic's not working or whatever it is, I do have the chat open and I'm able to see your thoughts and your questions and your comments that way and I can share it with the group. Um, there's also that little person with its hand up, so that's a great way to get my attention really quickly. Um, you know, just the way we're, we're uh, my, my own office set up and like with cameras being on and off and all of that kind of thing, I'm not always able to see you if you raise your physical hand. So if you do have a question or a comment, I'd appreciate you using the little hand raise button um, just as a way for me to you know, see that you have something to say and I will get to your thought, your question right away. So that's a great tool to use to get my attention to. Um, of course, there's also the camera button. So, um, you know, I understand Zoom fatigue and stuff like that's a real thing. So if you want to have your cameras off, you are, of course, welcome to. Um, also, I love to see your faces, so up to you. Um, if you are having any trouble with your internet, though, sometimes cutting the camera will help that a little bit. And then there is that microphone button. So I believe everyone's muted right now. I will um, ask that we stay muted throughout the training just so that we eliminate any kind of background noise, any feedback, and everyone can kind of, you know, learn in a way that best suits them. But um, know that you are welcome to unmute yourself and interrupt me to ask a question at any point in the training. So that's totally fine. I don't mind at all. So you can unmute yourself whenever you need to there. Okay. So that's a little bit about Teams. Um, also, before we start, I just want to take a moment to kind of create our space together as well, even virtually, and just make sure that this is a safe space that we all feel comfortable to share in. So just with that in mind, I will say that it's important for us to understand we're all going to be approaching this topic at different points and lengths in our journey and our understanding today, right? And that's whether you have, you know, lived experience, whether you work in a frontline setting or not, whether this is brand new for you, right? All, all experiences are welcome. Um, so with that being said, this is absolutely a safe space and it is to be a judgment-free space as well. So no story or question is off limits as long as it's phrased responsibly respectfully. Can't hear me, hey? Um, okay, we'll try Gloria if you are having tech issues. Um, is that, let me know if anyone else is having the same problem. Um, otherwise, it could be that you need to turn up the volume on your computer. So if anyone else is having a similar issue, hopefully you can hear me okay and you can see the um, slide deck okay and everyone else can kind of let me know. Otherwise, I can try and put my headphones in and see if that helps. Um, yeah, so we'll be discussing some sensitive topics today. So you might already have experience with managing an opioid emergency, and this could bring up some unreconciled feelings, thoughts, trauma surrounding the topic. So. Just at any point, if you find yourself feeling overwhelmed, if you don't want to participate in the discussions, you're free to abstain from that. And if you find yourself feeling overwhelmed, I really, really encourage you to take a step back, right? Take that time to look after yourself. We're happy to catch you up on anything that you've missed. Um, if you do need to leave, just shoot me a message so that I know I can I can follow up with you, make sure that you're okay. And again, we can catch you up on anything that you miss, missed afterwards. Um, but yeah, just throughout the training today, make sure that you're really honoring yourself and looking after your needs if possible, okay? So let's get into the course objectives and kind of what to expect in the time that we have together today. So we're actually going to start by talking about stigma and harm reduction. And these are the two pillars that are really gonna form the foundation of our training today. So in the moment, naloxone is excellent at saving a life, but if we want to talk about combating this public health crisis and saving lives long term, destigmatization and harm reduction is where we need to start. And so that's why we start there in our training. After that, we're going to do kind of the full wraparound on opioids. So, you know, what they look like if you've never seen them before, so you could identify them, how they work in the brain, that kind of stuff. 
After that, we're going to talk about how to actually manage an opioid emergency from front to back. OK, then we're going to talk about following um, aftercare and really how we take care of ourselves after managing this type of situation. We want to recognize that managing an opioid emergency, it can be incredibly stressful and in, and it can be traumatic. And that's, you know, regardless of the outcome of the rescue itself, and it can have a lasting effect on the rescuer. And so in the last portion of our training today, that's where we're really going to start the conversation on mental health and hopefully give you some tools so that you can have a um, you know, a guide to help you get back to a place where you want to go emotionally after managing an emergency like this uh, with the support of your loved ones. So we're going to go through that at the end as well. And then finally, it's important to note that everything we say in St. John Ambulances or in this training is St. John Ambulances stance on best practice for this type of emergency. So that doesn't mean our instruction will supersede your own organization's policies and procedures. If they do happen to change after something that you've learned in the training today, of course, we'd love to hear about it, but it will always be your house, your rules. OK, all right. So let's get started. Um, like I mentioned, we're going to start with uh, module one, which is defining drug stigmatization and harm reduction. And hopefully by the end of this module, you're going to be able to recognize the impact of trauma and adverse childhood experiences on substance dependency or drug addiction. You're going to be able to define stigma and harm reduction and have an understanding of the Good Samaritan Drug Overdose Act. OK. So I'm going to start by bringing your attention to this quote by Dr. Glenn Doyle. He's a relatively well-known psychologist in the States who has a background in working with people who have experienced trauma and abuse. And you can see in this quote, he says, you don't just treat addiction, right? You end up treating anxiety, depression, PTSD, loneliness, rage, despair, toxic secrets, regret, undiagnosed head trauma, and untreated ADHD. And then you realize that addiction is often someone's best attempt to cope when they don't see other options, right? So that's the piece we really want to focus in on today, right? It is that person's best attempt to cope when they don't see other options. So let's talk about that now. Um, this quote is definitely a positive step forward because it does introduce the concept and the correlation between trauma and substance dependency. And that's a connection that many people might not be aware of. And it's, it's really important to consider in terms of encouraging empathy and compassion both during the rescue itself, but also just in life in general, right? When interacting with people who are managing various degrees of substance dependencies. All of that being said, the quote does just miss the mark a little bit because it does frame the entire the entire system of substance dependency as stemming from from trauma as traumatic. And we want to recognize experiences outside of trauma as well that could potentially lead to a dependency or a poisoning, right? Perhaps that person was prescribed an opioid and then they unexpectedly developed that dependency and all of a sudden their their prescription runs out and they're left having to manage that dependency and don't really know what to do, right? Or maybe someone just chooses to use drugs or opioids in the pursuit of an experience right just recreationally and and that's perfectly okay too but poisonings can occur in that situation as well either way the quote is important because it does bring to light the fact that a person is not their substance dependency right nor should they be defined by it they are a person with all the complexities that come with being a human on this planet who has developed an illness so one statistic to support this correlation between trauma and substance dependency that was found during the cre creation of this curriculum was that individuals who survive six or more adverse childhood experiences are which are um, adverse childhood experiences that are potentially traumatic events that occur in childhood and they've been seen to have a tremendous amount of impact on a person's future health and well-being so individuals who survived six or more adverse childhood experiences were found to be 46 times more likely to use IV drugs than people who report no adverse childhood experiences, right? So just considering that person is self-medicating because of these adverse childhood experiences or untreated trauma because they do not have access to treatment or support through these traumas or a supportive community to help them through. And this is how they know how to cope, right? Again, coming back to that, that quote that we just read. So essentially here, we really want to get to looking at substance dependency as more so the symptom of an illness with the illness itself often being that trauma. 
So just with that correlation in mind, we can really start to think, OK, um, you know, what is it that we are often taught of as being, you know, a gateway drug, right? As the, as they say that phrase. And I can imagine when I said that what popped into your head was maybe cannabis, right? Or alcohol. And what we're saying here is actually no, it's much more so trauma that can be that that gateway drug, right? That driving force behind substance use. So one last thing to consider um, that's also important is just when we understand the link between trauma and substance dependency, um, we also understand that trauma. Someone muted me. <laughs> um, there are, you know, all of these narratives in society that really stereotype people who use drugs in an in inaccurate and harmful way. For example, right, there's a misconception uh, that this public health crisis is only impacting people experiencing homelessness, right? And so in contrast here with that stereotype, Public Health Ontario recently released their most recent data um, this spring that showed that actually 87% of opioid poisoning related fatalities are actually happening in private dwellings, right? So what we need to understand is that there is no one type of person who uses drugs and no one type of person who is at risk for an opioid poisoning, right? It has nothing to do to socioeconomic status or, or anything else, right? We can even think of celebrities who have struggled with opioid use and unfortunately lost their lives of it, of it um, such as Tom Petty, right? Or Mac Miller or Prince. So now let's get into stigma and just another way to put it simply stigma is just judgment over another person, but a basic definition of stigma. It's a stereotype or a label that we unfairly place onto a group of people and it really strips away their individuality and their humanity. It basically makes their entire identity that stereotype behavior and then that stigmatization goes on to inform how we view and treat those who fall under that demographic. So I actually do have my first question for you all. So hopefully you're prepared. Um, this is kind of the participation discussion piece of the training. Um, my first question for you is, um, why do you think people stigmatize those who are managing a substance dependency, right? Where does that stigma stem from, do you think? So again, you're welcome to use the chat, right? You, it's quicker, honestly, if you unmute yourself and speak or use the hand raise button, but I do want to hear your thoughts on why do you think people stigmatize those who are managing a substance dependency? All right, television. Yeah, Phil, if you want to elaborate a little bit more on that, I mean, I have a sense that you're talking about the media, which I totally agree, but I, I even ask you to say a little bit more. Um, Gloria, you unmuted yourself there. Did you want to share something? Uh, yes, uh, I believe uh, in some cases is a matter of lack of understanding and sometimes people don't have the tools so they kind of judge what they see in front of them rather than looking at the underlying issues that a person may be facing in their life experience. Absolutely, right? So I like you nailed it there, right? The lack of understanding or the lack of education on substance dependency, on the impact of trauma, on all of it can have such an impact, right? Because like you were talking about, um, maybe that person doesn't have the tools or the understanding to, um, you know, or even know the person to know what they've been through, um, all that they're managing, all of that. And that can really lead to a lack of empathy sometimes when there is that lack of understanding and lack of knowledge. Um, and especially to when there's that lack of education on, on substance dependencies, and then it kind of plays into that incorrect narrative of a substance dependency as being some kind of choice, right? So um, when there is that misconception, it becomes very easy to judge, to stigmatize, to blame because that person has, you know, an incorrect uh, view of substance dependency and they're like, oh, well, why can't that person just stop using? Like they're they're making that choice every day. And that's really a harmful uh, narrative that we want to move away from, again, with more education and with a better um, understanding of the nature of, of the disease and, and the impact of trauma. Um, and lack of understanding can lead to fear as well, which is um, sometimes just when we don't, we fear what we don't understand, right? And so because there is that fear and maybe not having the tools in terms of knowing how to help even, then it's just easier to kind of judge and push away and create that distance. So we're trying to create more safety for ourselves, if that makes sense. Did you have something you want to add there? 
Uh, I also want to touch base on something that a lot of people, I guess, really don't understand, and that is the fact that sometimes there's a dual diagnosis, and there may be mental health as well as the substance abuse and stuff. So their addictions may be related to other things as well. So sometimes if we don't have all the knowledge and understanding of those uh, I guess struggles each one of the people may be facing uh, mm -hmm. and we make judgments sometimes we close the doors for them to be able to reach out and, and, get support that so and Anthony just sent me a screenshot of an email absolutely. from Glenn absolutely. It says, oh I've, I've started noticing that a lot okay. of our libraries haven't been updated with new course dates Richard I think that I think that that was uh I think that um maybe something else is happening on the sides at work or something like that but really good point Gloria again just further um you know highlighting the fact that um, each person is an individual who has, you know, an individual history and individual life and, and all of those things can come into play and that dual diagnosis aspect of it. Um, and then you made a really good point in terms of the impact of that, of that stigma and stereotyping, which we're going to talk about in a second as well. Um, I'll just reiterate a couple of things to um from the chat so philip added in our phil sorry added in terms of he had said or they had said television um and then they added so media and tv often shows these individuals as bad guys or untrustworthy right so we really want to consider the way that the media is coming to frame our perspective um in these really stigmatizing and stereotyping and negative ways and we're absorbing that whether we're conscious of it or not right so it's really interesting to think the way that that can further their play out and it's almost sometimes maybe not even a conscious choice it's like oh that's why we want to have these discussions because we can really get to to thinking about where our perspectives are stemming from and how we're being influenced without us necessarily realizing it um christy added to fear of the unknown and media influence right so kind of connecting with what we've been talking about um in terms of fear and media ashley added to lack of education on substance abuse and seeing it as a flaw of character rather than a societal issue right so again um that weird connection of like morality right that can be attached to the use of certain substances over others and we want to consider the way that our systems in society are, are kind of pushing that right in terms of you know what is made legal versus illegal right and the programs that we go through in school like abstinence-based programming stuff like that like all of these outside things these things within society structure that kind of thing that come to frame our perspectives in terms of you know attaching certain certain substances as good certain substances as bad and therefore certain people who use the certain substances um as deemed bad like then through that association um are are viewed as bad as well right and so that's that that weird morality attachment to the use of certain substances over others so um that is a great point to make as well ashley and then addison added lack of personal experience learned from learned stigma from generations before so that's really important too right even you know doesn't have to be within society structural right could be within like a family structure that that stigma is learned behavior um and so you may have been influenced you know through through your family and grown up with certain beliefs and um maybe never thought to question them before right so again it's just why it's it's interesting and important to have this discussion so that we can begin to consider myself included right our own biases um and where they might be stemming from so with that in mind let's then talk about the impact of that stigma right so gloria had already mentioned um you know it is it can really make that person feel hesitant or not feel feel safe or comfortable to reach out for assistance so it really creates a massive massive barrier in that way because they know that they will be judged right they will be shamed they will have a label attached to them that um, may follow them throughout uh, whatever else they're managing in their life right so uh, in that way stigma can create such a massive barrier for that person in terms of accessing support whether that is harm reduction support and and, and working towards safer substance use maybe it's support in um you know not using substances but whatever that is that stigma puts up a massive massive barrier um can anyone think of any other um 
any other ways that that stigma can really impact the person managing that substance dependency, right? So thinking in terms of, again, you know, their decision making, access to resources, uh, abil abil ability to connect with their community and, and receive support. Any other thoughts there? Isolation, absolutely, Katie. Right, it can be so, so isolating. Um, and, you know, that stigma can really lead to that person feeling the need to hide their substance use, right? Potentially using a loan, which we know can be so, so dangerous. Um, and really that sense of isolation and hopelessness as well, which is devastating. Um, in times of struggle, right, as humans, we we need community around us to support us and to lift us up. And we, we all need that. And the stigma perpetuates that isolation that can be so, so, so harmful. Um, any other thoughts? Anything else anybody wants to add? Okay, looks like we might be good. So I'll just add, um, I'll add a couple extra thoughts that have come up from class before. So um, one thing is just that stigma can negatively, like even within, you know, healthcare settings, it can negatively influence healthcare providers' perceptions of people with a substance dependency, and that can go into impact the care that that is provided. Unfortunately, we've seen countless studies on that. We've we've heard um, many firsthand stories within class. Um, you know, whether that is an instance of someone maybe experiencing a mental health crisis, right, and they go to the hospital, right, to try and receive support for their mental health crisis, but because of their their substance dependency they're turned away or someone going to try and get treatment for a completely unrelated issue right maybe it's a tooth abscess maybe it's a broken bone something like that but um, because of the substance dependency again that is all that they are seen for right they are labeled and then um you know again often turned away or or stigmatized or judged um in that effort to 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 seek uh, care. And so that can be a really devastating impact of the stigma as well. And then lastly, I just want to talk about internalized stigmatization as well. So Katie had mentioned, you know, that feeling of isolation and, and you know, added to that in terms of um, potentially, you know, that feeling of hopelessness too, of, of needing to hide. And we also want to consider the horrible impact of that internalized stigmatization because when you um, are treated as less than day in and day out, or you know, you know, you will be perceived as as um, as being judged or or labeled because of the dependency. Either way, it's that internalization of of the shame and the guilt, and that just creates such a massive barrier as well. Because then it's not even an issue of like, okay, well, what's available to support me, and how do I get there safely, right? It's an issue of, well, I'm not going to reach out for support. I'm not going to talk to anyone because I don't feel like I'm worthy of that support, right? And you can imagine how difficult that is to overcome. Um, so that internalized stigmatization is a really, really harmful impact of the stigma as well and creates a, a huge barrier. So barriers from the outside and from the inside as a result of that stigma. OK, so thank you so much for everyone for your for your contributions to the conversation today. Well, we'll keep the conversation um, going. So continue to feel free to use the chat and um, chime in when you would like. While systemic stigmatization might take a little bit more than the two hours that we have together to dismantle, something to consider is the way that our language can either contribute to create that stigma or it contributes towards destigmatization. Right, so language is something that we can take on right away. It's a first step that we can take on um, towards destigmatization. And so let's take a look at that. Let's look at some new terms that don't carry such stigmatizing weight. So this chart, it comes in your handout as well. Um, so don't feel like you need to write all this down. So I will mention I didn't at the beginning, but I did send out that handout prior to class and that should be um, a good review of all the information that we're going to be going through today. So I don't want you to feel like you have to be like furiously writing down notes or anything like that. Um, I just want you to be able to sit back, take in the information and you have all of that review in your handout. So this comes in your handout, um, so I'm just going to give an overview of this and you can look at it in more detail in that handout, which I very much encourage you to do later. 
Essentially, what this chart is doing is it's breaking down some old and potentially harmful or stigmatizing terms that you might be familiar with. Um, so that's on the left hand side, those older stigmatizing terms. And then on the right hand side, you have what you might consider using instead that reflect perfs and first language and destigmatization. OK, so let's take a look at an example of using person first language, right? Instead of saying addict, we have a bunch of different, um, you know, options. Person with a substance disorder, um, asking people how they identify or even person who uses drugs, PWUD as the word or a person managing a substance dependency, right? And the reason we want to move away from um, from just labeling someone and, and calling the saying the word addict essentially is that not only does that word carry a negative connotation because um you know it it's oh sorry and not only is it automatically stigmatizing because the word carries a negative connotation is what i was trying to say but it also implies first that that behavior is permanent right and also that that is all that they are right and it completely misses all the other important parts of that person's identity like we were talking about before a person is not their substance dependency and nor should they be defined by it and so this is a way that we can use our language to intentionally reflect that by using that person first language. Another term, just to point out another one on the chart there that you might notice is the term clean, right? Well, if you think about it, when you use the term clean, that implies that the person was was dirty before, right? So some suggestions to use instead could be simply saying abstinence, abstinent from drugs, right? Or being in remission or recovery, for example. So a lot of um, examples of shifts that you can make and, and using more intentional language as you move throughout your day. Um, one last shift that I want to point out here is St. John Ambulance's choice to support using the word poisoning versus the word overdose um, to describe this type of emergency. When you think about it, the reason is essentially that the word overdose, it implies that the person intended to consume the substances in such a quantity that led to the emergency, right? That there is a certain amount or a threshold that someone might need to consume to have this type of emergency occur. And it's still eventually placing the onus on the individual, right? And that is not an accurate reflection of what's happening, especially in today's climate with the increased toxicity of the unregulated supply. Again, um, that seems study I referenced earlier also found that 97% of opioid related deaths in Ontario um, have been shown to be accidental. I know, like I said, this is a national national program, but that's the study that that we had um, most recently. Uh, and again, accidental poisonings. And so what's actually happening here is that people are exposed to an opioid um, that leads to a medical emergency um, and they're accidentally being poisoned by a substance. And that's whether it's the case of someone consuming a completely different substance, for example, and then an opioid like fentanyl has been included in their drug of choice or that person's um, substance that they, they're using is, is fentanyl. Either way, the nature of the emergency is that it is, it is an accidental poisoning. And so armed with this new information, our language has shifted yet again to kind of better reflect that. When it comes to language, when we know better, we can, we can do better, right? We can we can choose, we can make that that intentional choice, like I was saying. Um, we're all capable of changing the way that we think and act when we learn new information. So you can think of an example of the way that language continues to evolve. I even like can think of an obvious example in a completely different context that I think we can all kind of resonate with. Um, very near and dear to my heart too, having worked with Special Olympics, but think about how back in the 80s, it was perfectly okay to refer to someone using um, the R word who is cognitive cognitively delayed or nearly divergent um, and that was perfectly acceptable but of course today we know better right because that word is ableist and it's discriminatory and it's really been weaponized towards individuals who are nearly divergent so thanks to members of this community advocating to not be referred to with such a word now we have language that better defines and embraces the full identity of the individual and that's what we're always striving for right so just another example of the way that language continues to evolve and we need to evolve with it 
Just to reiterate, why is language so important? It's because improper use of language and labeling terms creates stigma. And like we were just discussing, stigma then creates those systems where, you know, people, as they say, I'm not saying like fall through the cracks, right? They're not able or feel comfortable to reach out and access the supports that they need. And it leads to people feeling like they need to hide their substance use, which I just mentioned, um, that they need to avoid important conversations about their substance use and how to stay safe and also use alone, which is how we're we're losing people. So it really is important. One last thing I'll say about language is just um, the importance of letting people, letting those with lived experience choose how they want to identify as they are the true experts, right? So these suggestions in terms of new language to consider, they're really important in terms of destigmatization within your own personal networks, your own professional networks at the systemic level, but they're certainly not to be imposed upon people, especially those with lived experience as a way to make, uh, make someone wrong, right? We want to lead by example with our own language and others will follow. So if there's no questions on that, that'll take us to our next topic, which is harm reduction. So with harm reduction, the goal is always to equip people with the knowledge and the tools to reduce potential harms associated with a behavior. So we all practice harm reduction every day in our day-to-day -day lives, right? You can think about education on safe sex. That's often part of school curriculums. That is a form of harm reduction, right? Um, you know, consuming alcohol in a bar, right? That's another example of our supervised consumption site, but that is just with alcohol instead of maybe other substances. Um, wearing sunscreen is a form of harm reduction, one that I forgot to employ yesterday and felt the consequences last night. Um, even wearing a seatbelt is a form of harm reduction, right? That has been made the law. So we all practice harm reduction every single day. That philosophy, it can be applied to substance use as well. And so in the realm of substance use, harm reduction is a pragmatic approach or it's just a way of thinking ahead that shifts the focus away from the substance use itself and onto the consequences and the adverse effects of that substance use and tries to you know, mitigate those. So it just ensures that people who are using substances are able to do so more safely. It focuses on the health and the safety of the person using the drug, their human rights. It must be culturally informed. That's a really important piece. And it just involves practices that are committed to meeting people where they're at without judgment and without the precondition to the support that they stop using substances, right? So you're essentially, like it says on the slide there, looking for the path of least resistance to help people. So some examples of harm reduction policies, programs, practices that aim to minimize the negative impact of substance substance use. That could include things like safe consumption sites, for example, um, drug checking, non-abstinence based programming and housing initiatives, employment initiatives, um, availability and education on naloxone like we're doing here today, and even just provision of information on safer drug use. Uh, if you think about it, really, we push for and standardize harm reduction practices like I was mentioning in so many other areas of our world, right? Think of all the PPE and first aid that goes into a construction site, or like I said before, wearing a seatbelt is the law now. These are all accepted standardized practices um, in those areas of the health and safety of a person and, and a behavior. And it really begs the question, why are we not seeing the same standard of safety and care when it comes to substance use? And so again, that stems back to the stigma and something that I hope as, you know, more education on harm reduction gets out there, um, we start to see some changes, some more standard resources become available without that attached stigmatization. So, in ties with harm reduction, let's talk about the Good Samaritan Drug Overdose Act super quickly. So this is a piece of legislative harm reduction. And so the Good Samaritan Drug Overdose Act, it applies to anyone who requests emergency support during a poisoning, be that the witness to the poisoning or the person needing the urgent medical care themselves. And it will apply whether the person stays on the scene or if they, they leave the scene uh, before emergency services arrive. What this act essentially does is it will protect you from charges that you may otherwise face for possession of a controlled substance for your own use, okay, as well as any violations of conditions of your parole, bail, or probation as a result of that simple possession charge, okay, so it just covers that simple possession charge for your own use. While that is a super positive step forward, 
um, because we can understand, right, the reason, the intention it's put into place is because, you know, say you were consuming substances with your friend, um, there are substances on the scene that are illegal, um, your friend starts experiencing a poisoning, right, you might be very hesitant to call for help because you don't want the police to come, you don't want to get arrested for having those substances. So this act was put into place to protect you um, from those types of charges so that you do feel comfortable to call for help so that that person can receive the medical assistance that they need um, and that you aren't criminalized for possession for your own use. Um, so it's intended for that reason, but it does not fully protect against criminalization. So I will mention that as well because it's not going to protect against any other offenses outside of that simple possession charge. So if that if you have any other outstanding warrants, for example, if you can be charged for anything else on the scene, um, you could still get charged for that. So yeah, you can understand while this is a positive step forward, someone might still be afraid maybe to call for help. Um, but it is important that, you know, we have a good understanding of this. Not everyone even is aware that it exists. So it's really important to understand that this is here um, as well as what it does cover and what it will not cover and have that understanding. OK, so that brings us to our second module, which is identifying opioid types and their impact. And uh, hopefully by the end of this module, like I said, you'll be able to identify opioids um, and recognize the impact of opioids. So Jennifer asked, is the Good Samaritan Drug Overdose Act all across Canada? And the answer is yes. Okay. So what are opioids? Yeah, no problem. Um, opioids are a class of powerful drugs that are used as pain medication. So I don't know, depending, but many people might be more familiar with what would be considered more like street obtained opioids, such as heroin or fentanyl. But there's also many, many prescription opioids that exist and are also often pres prescribed for pain, right? From, you know, after a surgery or an injury, for example. So things like codeine, for example, morphine, Demerol, Percocet, right? There's many, many opioids that are prescribed prescribed for pain as well. Uh, but let's take a look at some of those more so like considered to be street obtained opioids there. So um, let's start with heroin at the top. So heroin is a black or brown powder. It can also be a tacky, um, a black tar like substance, or it can be in that injectable form right there. Um, heroin is a derivative of morphine because, and it's made up of poppies. And so because of this, right, poppies need time to grow. Have a processing time to create heroin, and it takes a lot more time and money than other substances such as fentanyl that are synthetically made, right? So as a result, heroin in its purest form is extremely valuable. It's also extremely, extremely rare to find, and heroin's often laced or combined with other substances really to increase the volume um, and use less of that pure product because it is so expensive to produce. Um, so heroin, like we mentioned, is often taken through the lungs um, and injected into the veins, snorted into the nose, or chewing it in the mouth is another way to consume it as well. So now let's take a look at fentanyl. So fentanyl is purely synthesized substance uh, that can be produced in a lab, right? So it's chemically synthesized. Um, unlike heroin, it's because of that, super easy to manufacture and uh, relatively cheap, and it takes very little time, especially compared to heroin. So that's what's made it super, super common and way more readily available. OK, it's being used to often stretch out more expensive products such as heroin or it's being used um, and added into an, another substance as kind of like a new addictive additive, essentially so that suppliers can make more money with a smaller investment. OK, so that's why it's becoming so common. Um, fentanyl is tasteless and odorless, and it can come in the form of a pill, which you see there, which is often found in various colors. It'll kind of depend on um, where you are or, you know, your location, but like pink's common, purple, green, blue, whatever it is, often comes in a color of some time. It also comes in a patch or a liquid, um, a powder can also be found and it can be absorbed under the tongue, injected, smoked or snorted. 
Um, let's talk about the patch super quickly as well. So concentrated quantities manufactured into a patch, um, they're specifically designed to be absorbed through the skin. However, okay, fentanyl kind of on its own, if it's not in that patch form, can't accidentally be absorbed through the skin on basic contacts, such as touching the drug itself, okay? So that's a really common misconception of the drug. It's a big reason why people are really afraid to step in and help in a poisoning situation because they're afraid oh, I'm going to get a little fentanyl on my skin and I'm going to experience a poisoning. And so we really want to work to kind of debunk that myth. Um, touching fentanyl with your bare skin, it's not just going to absorb through your skin to cause a poisoning, but you do want to be cautious, right? You want to wear gloves and you don't want to get it into a cut, right? Because then it's entering your system and you don't want to touch it and then touch a mucous membrane where it can get into your system as well, right? So your eyes, your nose, your mouth, something like that because that just increases the risk. If you do get it onto your skin, you're gonna just wash it off with soap and water. Um, don't use sanitizer that will kind of like um, impact the barrier of your skin. So just stick with soap and water there and wash it off and you should be some completely fine. Um, and then lastly, let's take a look at counterfeit opioids. Okay, so counterfeit opioids can be a combination of any substances essentially, and they're super easy to manufacture. So um, the equipment to manufacture counterfeit pills is easily acquired on online sites such as Amazon or AliExpress, um, as well as a lot of the chemicals that are required to create, you know, even fentanyl or, or whatever other substance that they're trying to create into that pill. Although the equipment used to create counterfeit pills, they're not necessarily sold for the intention of manufacturing these substances um, illegally. There's really nothing to prevent the sale of those items and ingredients for, for that purpose. Um, what I really want to highlight here with counterfeit pills is that you can never know what's in a pill just by looking at it, right? Regardless of the stamp on it, regardless of the color, whatever it is. Um, you can never be sure what's in it just by looking at it. Uh, they do compare it to kind of um, like cho baking chocolate chip cookies in your kitchen, right? When you're baking chocolate chip cookies in your kitchen and you dole out the dough to the cookies and put it on the baking sheet, there's no way for you to really guarantee, you know, how many chocolate chips are in each cookie, the distribution of chocolate chips in, within the one cookie, right? Every cookie is going to be a little bit different. And so that's what they compare to um, manufacturing counterfeit opioids essentially right in that pill there's no way to know exactly the dosage inside the distribution of that of that dosage all of that so you might end up from the same batch one pill having you know four milligrams of fentanyl and one pill having 0 0.2 right from that same batch they look exactly the same same color same branding all of that um but there is that that difference right and there's just no way to know because it was made um in that in that counterfeit manner so that's where it starts to become very very risky to consume okay so next let's take a look at lethal doses so a lethal dose of opioids is the amount of opioid taking by a person that will lead to them stopping breathing and that will eventually lead to their death, right? So the amount that it takes for that to happen, that will vary person to person depending on their tolerance and relationship to opioids. So this model is more so for though with those with little to no experience with opioids. So you can see the images here for a lethal dose of heroin would be around 30 milligrams. Fentanyl, fentanyl requires much, much less. So we're looking at about three milligrams there. And then a lethal, lethal dose of car fentanyl, which is often used as, you know, an elephant tranquilizer. So you can think about how you know, carfentanil takes down something that large, how little it takes to, um, you know, be fatal for a human is only one grain, right? So that's really scary too. We're starting to see that come up more and more. Um, and uh, yeah, so that would be one grain would be the lethal dose. However, for those who have built up a tolerance to opioids, um, it might take up to three times the amount of this or maybe more to result in a poisoning, okay? So um, just recognize that a person's tolerance can change. So just as someone's tolerance can go up with increased use, it can also go down when there's a period of abstinence, such as, for example, if that person was incarcerated maybe or they went through a rehab program or whatever it is. And that change in tolerance, especially if you're going from a higher tolerance to a lower tolerance, that can be very dangerous and lead to a poisoning. So here is where we want to put in some harm reduction practices to really lessen the risk. Um, 
because you know that person might assume that they had the tolerance they had before and they can certain take a certain dosage but if their tolerance has dropped that dosage might now be uh, lethal for them right so here's where we want to consider going to a supervised consumption site right um to really making sure never to use alone um if you don't have someone uh that you're comfortable sharing you know like your plans in terms of when you're going to use your substance or whatever it is, there's a really great app and phone line you can call. It's called NORS, so N-O-R-S. You can Google that. That's a great resource. They just stay on the phone or connect with you through the app and make sure that you're safe as you are using um, that opioid or whatever it is. Um, so there's that. And then finally, too, beginning with a small dose and only increasing increments until the desired effect is achieved. So those are some basic harm reduction principles you can put into there to help mitigate the risk and tolerance changes. Okay, so now let's have a quick overview of what opioids do in the brain. Okay, we're going to try and understand this so that we can understand what naloxone does to counteract that interaction of the opioids on your neurons and your neurotransmitters. So essentially, opioids interfere with the way that neurons send, receive, and process signals via the neurotransmitters. And some drugs, such as heroin, for example, or fentanyl, what they do is they actually activate the neurons okay, in the similar way because their chemical structure mimics that of a natural neurotransmitter in the body. So what that does is it allows the molecules that make up the drug to attach onto and activate those neurons. However, although these drugs mimic the brain's own chemicals, they don't actually activate the neurons in the same way that a natural neurotransmitter would, okay? So that leads to abnormal messages being sent throughout the network, which is what's commonly referred to as being high. The problem is that one of the key messages that gets interrupted with the presence of opioids on those neurons is um, the message to breathe, okay? So therefore, when there are too many opioids in the system, the body stops receiving the message to breathe and the person's breathing will slow until it stops altogether. And this is where we're going to introduce naloxone. Okay, so this is just um, just really so that you have that visual. Um, if it's not playing for you, I'm going to type it into the chat. We can send it to you from our, our team resources, but fingers crossed. Um, sometimes it's just if you're coming from a Mac or a PC, it kind of changes if it will play for you or not. But um, let's see here. How do opioids interact with your brain? Opioids interfere with the way neurons send to receive and process the signal via neurotransmitter. Okay, perfect. So moving forward, that's when we introduced naloxone, like I was saying. So essentially naloxone, which you know you might recognize as Narcan, sometimes by community members, it's simply called the overdose drug. It's a medicine that rapidly reverses an opioid poisoning. And so what this means is essentially the molecule that makes up naloxone, what you can see it's doing here is it's attaching onto that neuron. So it's it's booting the opioid molecule off of that neuron, and it will attach itself on there in its place, as well as create a protective shield around that neuron, essentially so that the opioids don't get picked up, okay? So what happens next is because there is that naloxone's presence on those neurons, um, naloxone will actually allow for the body to reverse the effects of the opioid's impact on the system. It will allow for the body to once again um, continue to send the messages that it needs to send. Those start flowing through again. Um, and that communication between the neurons, the message can once again be sent um, to breathe. And so that breathing starts, that person starts breathing on their own. Um, so let's take another look there so that you have that visual once again of how naloxone works.
Awesome. So just a neat little visual there for you to have as well for how naloxone works. Um, before we move on, okay, so let's just talk about a couple things to do with naloxone that are really important. First thing is naloxone will only work if that person that's breathing has slowed or stopped because of an opioid poisoning, okay? It only works for opioids. And what this means is that Naloxone's not going to have an impact on that. It will only help for opioid poisonings. So that can be a challenge, especially if you're managing maybe multiple substances have been consumed, that kind of thing. But on the other hand, it also makes naloxone pretty safe to um, to administer, right? Because if you misdiagnose the situation and the person's not experiencing an opioid poisoning, administering naloxone to them, it's not going to cause any harm, right? Because they don't have opioids in their system. So it's not going to um, cause harm to them. So it's relatively safe in that way. So that's one thing to remember. The other really important thing to remember is that naloxone is metabolized by the body and it will wear off after 20 to 40 minutes. Okay. And as you saw in that video, Naloxone doesn't get rid of the opioids in the system, right? It simply creates that protective shield opioids from attaching. So therefore, when the naloxone wears off, a poisoning is likely to reoccur because those opioid molecules are going to have that opportunity to attach onto the neuron again and cause those poisoning symptoms. So that's why it's important to always seek medical attention and stay with the person until emergency services arrive, even if they wake up, right? And you're going to monitor for those signs of a poisoning until EMS arrives as well, just knowing that you may need to administer naloxone again, depending on how long the emergency services take. Um, Richard said, are there any side effects to Narcan use or too much Narcan? Um, and Katie asked, should 911 be called before or, admin before or after administering naloxone? So Katie, I'm going to get into all the steps we need to know in just a moment. Um, Richard, in terms of side effects, so um, naloxone typically doesn't have any severe side effects. It might be a little uncomfortable in the nose. So the naloxone itself is not going to have that, but um, the naloxone will cause withdrawal symptoms and precipitated withdrawal, which can cause some pretty severe side effects um, from the withdrawal side of things. So that's something that you may need to manage um, in turn. We'll talk about that in a second, but um, depending on that person's relationship with opioids, right, those withdrawal symptoms can, can get really severe. Um, so that's that in terms of side effects, that's more so what you would be managing. Um, if you, in terms of giving them too much naloxone, um, Obviously, it's complicated by those withdrawal symptoms, which should be taken very, very seriously. But um, on more so like a tolerance level, after about 10 milligrams of naloxone, um, the body can't absorb anymore. So at that point, you're just wasting doses essentially until that window of effectiveness has passed. So 20 to 40 minutes. Um, so 10 milligrams is, is kind of the maximum uptake within the body. If um, what that typically works out to with the nasal, so we're going through how to use the nasal naloxone today, right? And the nasal has about four milligrams per applicator, but just because of, you know, every, all the head stuff in your head and, and you know, some maybe coming back out the nose, stuff like that, not all four milligrams are going to be directly absorbed. So anecdotally, um, Bang, who created this curriculum, shared with me, it's usually about six doses would be the absolute max of the nasal naloxone before it's not really going to have much more of an impact because the body's kind of at the maximum threshold there. So again, withdrawal symptoms in terms of complications and, and giving too much is, is a whole nother side of things, but um, there's also kind of the maximum amount that the body can take in, um, and that would be around six doses uh, or 10 milligrams. Okay, so let's move forward and we're going to get into managing an opioid poisoning emergency now. Okay, so, um, we're going to talk first about how to assess an opioid poisoning. We're going to talk about um, what comes inside a kit. And we're also going to talk about um, how to administer that nasal naloxone. So what is an opioid poisoning? We've already kind of touched on it, but I'll touch on it again. So opioid poisonings happen when there are so many opioids or a combination of opioids or other drugs in the body that that person is not responsive to stimulation and or their breathing is inadequate. 
And this happens, like I said, because the molecules that fit up, they make up an opioid. Um, they fit onto the specific receptors that also affect the drive to breathe and they interrupt that message to breathe. And then because of that, if someone's not breathing or they're not breathing enough, the oxygen levels in the blood will decrease. Um, first, you'll see signs of cyanosis, so signs of that oxygen deprivation, and that will show up in the fingernails and the lips. They'll, they'll turn color. It'll be pretty obvious. Um, so for BIPOC folks, so Black, Indigenous, person of color, typically that looks like a dark purple to the fingernails and lips or a graying tone. Um, and for a white presenting person, typically what that will look like is like a white, or I'm sorry, a bluish tinge to the fingernails and lips and like progressing to purple to dark purple or even black sometimes depending on the degree of the oxygen deprivation but either way you will notice it distinctly in the fingernails and lips there those signs of cyanosis and that oxygen starvation will eventually stop other vital organs like the heart and then the brain which is what leads to unconsciousness coma and then death so within three to five minutes without oxygen, brain damage starts to occur and that's soon followed by death. And with opioid poisonings then, surviving or dying, it wholly depends on breathing and on oxygen. And what this means for you, um, as you're potentially first on site for this kind of emergency is that you have a window because people will usually slowly stop breathing. It will happen minutes to tens of minutes after the drug was used. So not a large window, but you do have a window to kind of react, step in, respond. Um, so hopefully there is time to intervene between when that poisoning starts and before we lose that community member. Um, so let's take a look now at some signs and symptoms of an opioid poisoning. OK, so um, we've kind of divided this chart into uh, what you're going to look for in the mouth, in the fingers, in the eyes and in the body. And then we've also identified kind of three separate presentations of the poisoning to kind of reflect uh, what we're currently seeing in the in the unregulated supply and the way that the different substances can kind of come into play to show different signs and symptoms, if that makes sense. So. On the far left side there, you have what would be considered more so like your typical poisoning uh, scenario. So like a typical, so to speak, opioid poisoning. Um, what you'll see there is that the breathing is very slow or irregular or they may not be breathing at all. Right, you might hear some some deep snoring or gurgling sounds in the chest. So kind of like if you've ever heard someone with sleep apnea try and breathe while they sleep like that. <sighs> get like sound like that it'll sound like that but wetter almost but you'll hear labored breathing potentially uh they'll have tiny tiny pinpoint pupils um those signs of cyanosis are another big one right so a change of color in the fingernails and the lips um, and then they potentially have loss of consciousness so they're passed out you can't wake them up or they're unresponsive right not answering when you talk to them or shake them and the body like i said is very limp so that's more so your typical presentation. Moving on to the middle column there, that's what you may see occur if um, some sort of opioid with like a really high potency, such as carfentanil or niazines have been consumed and it causes a really rapid onset to the poisoning and the person will clench up. Um, so what that looks like, and, and we call it a dissociative poisoning. Peers sometimes call it an ugly overdose as well, just because the person will be clenched up like that. Um, so yeah, what that will look like, I'll try and spotlight myself here, is the person's jaw will be clenched shut, their lips pulled back, right? Their chest and neck and all their other muscles are really stiff and taut and flame and um, like really stiff and taut and strained. Sorry. So their chest is super stiff. Their arms might be to their to their um, chest as well. Their hands might be in fists like they're very, very clenched up in addition to um, the other signs of a poisoning like pinpoint pupil, signs of cyanosis, all of that. The difference with this presentation is that that clenching and that stiffness. It almost feels like rigor mortis here. Um, of course, that's going to make, um, you know, everything we're going to get into in terms of ventilation, CPR, all of that more difficult, right? If they're clenched and their jaws clenched like that and they're stiff. Um, but those steps are still imperative. So you just have to do the best that you can in that scenario. Um, and then hopefully as the naloxone begins to work and the brain and body come back online, you see those those um, muscles begin to relax. And then finally, on the far right side there, um, that's another alternative symptom that, again, doesn't happen every single time, but it happens uh, typically because there is some kind of benzodiazepine being mixed with that opioid. So that's something else that we're seeing and hearing of happen more and more, where there is a combination being 
And it leads to what we call an atypical poisoning or peers often call um, a soft overdose. And so what that looks like is it'll kind of present as like your typical poisoning um, up until you administer the naloxone. So you'll see kind of those typical opioid poisoning um, symptoms appear and you follow the steps of the rescue, you've administered naloxone, and that's when you're gonna notice the difference because essentially what will happen here is that that person will begin to breathe again, right? So their breathing comes back to a sustainable rate and the signs of cyanosis in their fingernails and lips disappear because they have enough oxygen because they're breathing, but they don't actually wake up, which is something people have come to expect um, when they are, you know when someone does respond to an opioid poisoning um in this case this scenario they're going to remain unconscious and fully unresponsive and the reason for that is like we talked about naloxone's only going to help for the opioid side of things the opioids impact on the body and so in this case that person is still in that benzo induced coma and the naloxone's not going to help with that side of things so the person starts breathing again because the opioids are you know being taken care of but they don't regain consciousness because the benzodiazepines are still keeping them under okay so that's that's a different scenario that you may run into. If this happens, it is essential that you stay with that person, that you watch them so, so closely, and that you know that emergency services are going to arrive and be able to take over. Um, you want to watch them so, so closely because just again, another reminder that naloxone is going to wear off after 20 to 40 minutes. And if that person's already unconscious, right, those signs of a poisoning that's returning, it's going to be more subtle if they're already in that unconscious state. So you need to watch them closely and um, be prepared to administer more naloxone should you need to. OK, so with these signs and symptoms, which again are in your handout, um, good to get familiar with them. If you observe even one of these symptoms, you're going to investigate whether or not they're being poisoned. If you observe two or more, for sure you're stepping in. You're going to go into emergency management mode, treat this at a medical emergency and call 911 or your local emergency services right away. So let's get into that now. Um, starting off with um, Assessing the scene for risks when we come onto the scene. So one important thing to keep in mind when you are managing this type of emergency is that you can't help someone if you try and step in and then you get hurt, right? So that's why it's important to do a quick risk survey, um, a quick safety sweep, as they call it, looking out for things that could be of danger to you. So um, we have some identified here. If you have any extras that you want to type into the chat in terms of what you might be looking for on the scene, you're welcome to do so. Um, but typically we identify, I mean, in addition to the general safety of the scene, um, we want to look out for sharps. So that could be needles, could be, you know, broken glass from a pipe or something like that. Um, we want to look out for other drugs on the scene more so for context for emergency services when they arrive um, as well as bodily fluids of course um, other community members right that's a big one because you want to consider they might be in distress right or they might be trying to protect their friend and try and intervene or maybe also experiencing a poisoning so you want to be aware of you know who you have around you and and kind of what state they're they're at and then um, finally survival pets of some kind right so animals or survival pets they wouldn't know if you're trying Trying to help or harm their person and they you know they are there to protect their human so they also might try and intervene in a way that might not be good for you so you want to be really cognizant of if there are any animals any pets around that look displeased so that's how you might assess the scene for risks Next, let's look at what you should have on you when you're responding to an emergency. So this is, you know, an ideal list. You can consider it an updated, expanded first aid kit. You want to prepare to have this on your person when you're responding to an opioid poisoning, but, you know, it might not be possible in every single scenario if um, you know, maybe you're just coming across that poisoning and, and you weren't prepared, but do your best to be prepared with these things. What you want is at least two naloxone kits, and that's just because there could be times when someone needs more than the two doses of naloxone that come in each kit. So for the nasal, it comes with two. Um, the intermuscular varies. It comes with about two to four, just depending on where you're getting it from. But you may need extra doses to wake them up, so it's good to bring extras. 
You want to have a phone on you as well so that you can call for 911 or your local emergency services, of course. Uh, you want to bring extra gloves with you as well. So gloves do come in your kit, but you want to bring in a few extra pairs just in case they rip, right? You always want to make sure that you are protected when you're handling things. Um, it doesn't hurt to have a roll of tape as well, so that would be optional, but it could be best practice. And the reason we recommend having a roll of tape in your emergency kit is that if there are sharps or needles or anything that you want to move um, out of the way without touching, you can use the tape to do that. So you would undo the tape, press the tape to the sharp. So of course, we're looking at like a thicker tape, like a duct tape, masking tape, something like that. Press the tape to the sharp, gently lift it, and you can put it to the side, taping it to the wall or to the ground way out of the way. Again, so you're making the scene safe um, and disposing of it without accidentally touching it. And then we always recommend not to wear sandals. That's especially if you are at risk of coming across a poisoning scenario um, in a work setting, right? Then we would always say, don't wear sandals to work. Consider that part of your PPE. If you're just managing your day-to-day -day life, I know in the summer, like I wear sandals, um, you know, often, and, and sometimes you can't necessarily help what you have on your feet. But if you are wearing sandals when you respond to in poisoning, just be very, very cautious and understand that, you know, stepping on a sharp is a real possibility. Um, as well as, you know, that person waking up, they might vomit onto your feet, all sorts of stuff. So whenever possible, you want to have closed toed shoes um, and nice thick soles and just keep your feet safe that way. OK, so we just talked about the kit, so now I will spotlight myself and I will show you what is inside it. OK, so it looks like this. OK, um, it's got a hard case to it on the there are those two doses of the nasal naloxone. So I'll take it out in case you haven't seen it before. Okay, it looks like this. You can see this has a red plunger to it. So that's the newest formula. The older formulas had a white plunger. You're going to see those less and less. Yours is going to be the new one, the red formula. Um, the difference is essentially that with this formula, it just has a wider range of temperature tolerance for storage, just a little more temperature stable. Um, so for these ones, the the minimum temperature, so it'll freeze below 15 degrees, okay, but it can be frozen and thawed countless times and it stays just as effective. And the maximum temperature it can go up to is 40 degrees, after which point it will, um, it will become less and less effective. So just be aware of that, you know, maybe not the best place to keep it in your car, in the glove box on a hot summer's day or something like that, because that will start to degrade uh, the efficacy of it. Um, and then it does expire after two to three years. Again, if it expires and if it goes over that heat threshold, it's not going to cause any harm when you use it. It just becomes less effective. So in a pinch, if that's all that you have, definitely still use it because some naloxone is better than none. OK, so you've got two doses in there. You also have a face barrier. I'll show you how to use that in a second as well as a pair of non-latex gloves, like I said, but you want to bring more with you. Um, there's also a card in there that identifies you as someone who has been trained to administer the naloxone, so you can fill that out when you get it. And then finally, there are there's like a little poster in here with the save me steps that we're going to get into. So, so the steps that you follow to manage the emergency, um, I would recommend you take this poster out and put it somewhere that you're going to be able to review it often, right? A fridge, a staff bulletin board, something like that. Ideally, you want to see these often and memorize these steps so that in an emergency, it's kind of like you're hardwired to perform the task should you need to, okay? So that's what comes in your kit. Um, now let's show you how to administer the naloxone, okay? So I will show you this now. We're just going to start with this, and then we're going to get into the actual steps of managing the rescue, but we'll just show you basically how to administer the naloxone first. So it's pretty intuitive, okay? All you're going to do is take out the package. You're going to peel the back of the package. It's easy to peel back like the top of a yogurt container or something. You're going to hold it with your thumb on the bottom of the red plunger, okay, and two fingers on the nozzle, just like that, okay, firm. Um, the ideal position you want someone to be on is on the ground and on their back, after which point you're going to tilt their heads back. 
you're going to place and hold the tip of the nozzle into either nostril and you're actually going to press it up until your fingers touch the bottom of the person's nose there. So you're really getting the tip up into the nose. OK, and then you're going to depress that red plunger firmly. You're going to release this full dose into the person's nose all in one go. And it's the same thing for a child. So for this nasal, you don't need to test it. You don't need to prime in any way. This is one dose. Like I said, you do the full thing all in one go. OK, so let's talk about complicating factors as well um, in terms of administering naloxone and managing this type of emergency in general. First thing is, um, if you deliver that dose of naloxone and you see a lot of the medication coming back out of the nose, it could indicate that there's a blockage in that nostril. OK, so first thing you're going to do is switch nostrils and try the opposite nostril. Um, deliver another dose right away and see if that helps. If the medication appears to be leaking out of both nostrils, again, that could indicate that there's a blockage on both sides. So I just want to stress first that nasal naloxone cannot be administered in someone's mouth as an alternative. It must go up their nose. So you just have to like do the best that you can to get as much medication up there as you can. That's why you keep the person's head tilted back. Um, but there's a couple options here. So first thing, you can um, let EMS know who EMS dispatch on the phone um, that you're having that problem and they can kind of direct you on steps to do. And then if you do have someone helping you, there is another uh, tactic you can take where you can try and kind of clear out the, the sinus and the nasal passage. So what that would look like is um, if there is a blockage on the right hand side, for example, I'm going to press that soft spot between the eye and the nose, pressing up and around for about 10 to 15 seconds or so. OK, following that, I'm going to pull the tip of the nose over to the left and then run my fingers firmly down the nose and then across the cheekbone, sweeping it to the side. You want to press really firmly here and you'll do that up for about 30 seconds or so. And that sometimes can help to clear the sinuses um, and make the the help like the medicine have more more access to where it needs to go. Um, but I want to stress that you're only going to try that little sinus massage thing um, if you have someone helping you and they can take point on that while you take point on the other save me steps. If you're managing this rescue on your own, there's no time to try that. OK, you're just going to manage the save me steps and do the best that you can um, on your own. So that's if there's a blockage. If you are administering to a toddler or a small child, OK, just be mindful because their noses are quite a bit smaller, right? So you're not going to be able to press it up as high um, and create that seal. So with a toddler or a small child, you want to be carefully tilting their heads back. Can make sure the seal of the medication to the nostril is tight. OK, you're going to block the other nose and you're going to depress the red plunger firmly um, like we talked about, but you want to leave the applicator up there for an extra 10 to 15 seconds or so for a toddler or a small child. And that just gives the medicine um, a little extra chance to kind of get where it needs to go without coming back out because their noses are smaller. Um, Another thing is improper position of the person or the head. So like I said, the ideal position is on the ground and on their back. It sets them up for administering nasal naloxone as well as for CPR. But just know that sometimes that might not be possible, whether it is that you can't move that person, whether they are in like a small enclosed space and, and it's just like not working to move them. Um, whenever you can, try and tilt the head back if you can't, if they're sitting up at least tilt the head back there um, and then just be aware that you know you might have to just manage it in the position that you find them in it can impact you know the results of the rescue but you're just again doing the best that you can with the circumstances and then finally if there is frozen naloxone as well so like i mentioned it will freeze below 15 degrees but it can freeze and thaw countless times and it's not going to be less effective uh, but ideally because it takes about 10 minutes to thaw and you can't administer it when it's frozen so ideally you don't want it to freeze because 10 minutes is a long time to wait when you're managing this kind of emergency so if you are doing any kind of outreach work anything like that try and keep the kit you know 
on the, like close to your body essentially so that the body heat can keep it warm and thawed. Um, and then if you do find that it has frozen, you're going to put it under your armpit or else if you're at a car or something, you can put it onto the heater of the car if it's already on and thaw it that way. And like I said, it takes about 10 minutes or so. So that's complicating factors for administering naloxone. Let's just take a quick look at some other complicating factors that might occur during the rescue, and then we're going to get into um, the save me steps that we'll talk about in a sec. So first thing is, if the naloxone doesn't seem to be working, right, it could be that the dose might have been delivered too late, unfortunately, and that that person's heart has already stopped. So in this point, you know, CPR is going to be important here. Um, it could also be that, you know, there are no opioids in the person's system, right? And remember, naloxone is only going to help if it's an opioid poisoning. So it could be a poisoning on something else. Naloxone is not going to really have an impact there. It could also be that the opioids are unusually strong and they require more naloxone, which so that can happen when um, there is fentanyl or carfentanil happening, for example. Um, so we'll get into the cycle of how and when to re-administer in a moment with the Save Me steps, but just be aware it could be that they require um, more than one dose for it to take effect. Um, and then we've already talked about administering to a child as well as the frozen naloxone. So um, and we've talked about the blockage, so that's that's good. OK, so that's if it doesn't appear to be working. Let's talk about if we come across a person who is unconscious and we have implied consent um, to step in and help. Yeah, so if that person is unconscious and we're coming onto the scene, of course, our priority is saving that life. We have that implied consent, like I just said, to step in and help. However, another complicating factor that can occur in the rescue is that that person is semi-conscious, right? Maybe they're 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 conscious, but they're like coming in and out of consciousness or like nodding out, as they say, um, and they do not consent to accepting an, an administration of naloxone. OK, so if they are refusing the naloxone, we really need to be respectful of this as they're likely trying to absorb absorb um, trying to avoid dope sickness or that precipitated withdrawal that I was talking about earlier. So. That's a very real thing. Uh, we'll talk about that for a second. So if someone has an opioid dependency, for example, um, if they receive naloxone, they're going to experience those withdrawal symptoms. And that can just look like the worst flu that you can even ever imagine times a thousand. So thinking awful, awful, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, dizziness, um, you know, potentially the feeling of bugs crawling under your skin, like a really deep, um, painful aching or burning in the bones, right? It is really, really intense. In severe cases, it can even lead to organ failure, to seizure. So um, it is that person definitely needs medical attention, right? And um, they need a lot of compassion and a lot of empathy in that moment, right? They are not being dramatic. That is a horrible, horrible thing to go through. So that is why they may refuse naloxone, even if they appear to be on the verge of a poisoning. Um, and we need to we need to be respectful of that. We need to be respectful of their wishes and, and their bodily autonomy and, and never force naloxone on a person if they are semi-conscious. What we can do, however, is really use our communication skills, our empathy, our compassion and our concern and advocate for and educate on that naloxone. Let them know what you're observing in this case, right? OK, listen, I am so concerned. It looks like you're experiencing a poisoning. These are the, the signs and symptoms that I'm seeing. I'm worried about you. I want you to be OK. Is it OK that I administer the naloxone? Um, you could talk a little bit more about, you know, what the naloxone is going to do, right? The naloxone is going to help you breathe so that you don't go unconscious. Um, can I please show you how it works, right? You can, again, show them, get them comfortable with the kid if they're if they're maybe a little afraid or anything like that that um, or maybe there's some creative solutions that that you can come up with right maybe they're not comfortable with you having um, to administer the naloxone maybe you're a stranger to them but they would be comfortable having a friend administer to the naloxone to them um, it, should they need it right so then you would show the friend how to use the kit and then you can sit with them as they do it right so stuff like that, just really focused on advocating and educating for that naloxone if they are still conscious. And then, of course, we do have that implied consent as well, should they be unconscious. Um, secondly, in terms of what to expect when the person's revived after receiving naloxone, so just want you to be prepared that, you know, 
they might be in distress, they might be frustrated, they may appear agitated. It's just important to remember that this person is experiencing a trauma in real time, and we really need to treat it as such with a tremendous amount of empathy and compassion. So you really want to create that, that scene as a safe scene, right? Be sure to inform them in slow and soft tones, you know, what's happened, that emergency service is on the way. I'm so glad you're back. Um, let them know that they're safe that their stuff is safe, that you've been watching out for them and their belongings. Um, you want to make sure that you're giving that person the, the space and privacy that they need as well. So definitely clearing out any crowds so that you're not adding to the confusion and distress that they're experiencing. And then if they're asking for space, right, back up and give them some space. Let them, you know, take a take a breather. It's um, a scary enough situation to go through without people being like all over you, right? So back up, monitor them from a distance um, and give them that that space um, and respect that as well. However, uh, while they may be in distress, the risk of actual violence occurring from a poisoning emergency uh, is very low. And I know that that's something else that people are often super hesitant about responding to an opioid poisoning because they have heard that when someone comes out of an opioid poisoning, they come back swinging, right? That there's violence and, and that's super, super rare. We can't say it's never happened, right? I'm sure it's happened in the past, but violence occurring when a person um, comes out of a poisoning is, is rare. And if it happens at all, just be aware that it's likely um, on intentional right that person just experienced a trauma and they're in their fight or flight response so all of the tips that we just gave above in terms of how to ensure a compassionate and kind and um, empathetic environment for rescue that can be really helpful too in trying to mitigate um, these types of, of fight responses However, unlike the fight response, the flight response is much, much more common, right? Where that person chooses to flee the scene when they're revived and before the paramedics arrive. And this, of course, is a very difficult position for you to be in as the rescuer because you don't get to find out that that person is safe. You don't get to know the outcome of the rescue, right? So it's really important in these chances that um, you know you did everything that you could. So can anyone think of some helpful tips or things to suggest? if the person wants to flee the scene after being revived with naloxone. So anyone have any thoughts there in terms of what we could do if they choose to leave? I'll let you um, make some suggestions in the chat. And then in the meantime, I will, um, I will make some suggestions as well. So first thing I would say would be to, you know, warn them if it were that it's going to wear off, right? Um, yes, Katie, you can say, assure them they won't be in trouble for it, right? Remind them of the Good Samaritan Drug Overdose Act as well. That's really important in terms of, you know, continuing that education and where that can come into place. That's amazing, Katie. Thanks. Um, and yeah, I was going to add to warn them that it's going to wear off, right? Okay, I know you want to leave. Just please remember that naloxone is going to wear off after 20 to 40 minutes, and it's likely you're going to experience the poisoning symptoms again or, you know, overdose if that's what they're more comfortable with. It's going to come back. So please be careful. Um, and then, you know, you can send them with a kit or send their friend with a kit. Um, you want to know what time you administered the naloxone, what direction they went in case EMS can find them. And then also all of those harm reduction practices that we've been talking about throughout class as well, right? And tell them like, okay, please, um, please uh, like don't use a loan, right? Go be with a friend, go to a supervised consumption site, call Norris, right? If you're gonna consume again, start small. Um, you still have opioids in your system, start small and then you can build from there, that kind of stuff, right? Um, yeah, Arlene, let them know to please be careful. Yeah, so really good tips there. So yeah, again, those are just a few things that you wanna make sure that you can leave them with so that you're making sure that, you know, you're doing the best that you can, which is what you always wanna do when you're, you're assessing the rescue scene. Okay, so now that we've identified the proper way to administer naloxone to a person, and we've gone through some complications that can arise when we're administering it, 
Now let's go through the, the steps of a typical rescue. So St. John Ambulance's opioid poisoning response training adheres to the Save Me mnemonic, which is a step-by-step -step procedure to manage an opioid poisoning emergency. So these are the steps that you would follow when coming onto the scene. So I'm just going to show you this slide. It's a quick summary of the entire Save Me procedure. And then we're going to go into each step a little bit more in depth in a moment. Okay. And this is also what comes in the poster in your kit. Um, so we really recommend you memorizing these steps. That's why we, we made it into like the handy mnemonic save me so that they're easy to remember um, so that you are hardwired to perform the, the task should you need to, right? So this save me, you can see S stands for stimulate. Um, then we move to A, which is airway. B, ventilate. So that's five breaths of ventilation. E, evaluate. M, medication, that's where we administer the naloxone, and then E, evaluate again. Essentially, on that last step, you're doing CPR for two to three minutes, evaluating for signs of improvement. If there's no improvement after two to three minutes, you're going to administer another dose in the opposite nostril and then continue that CPR. But let's take a look at these steps in a little bit more detail now. So like I said, S starts with stimulate. So just imagine you've just found someone that kind of looks like they're being poisoned, but you're not sure, right? They could be sleeping. They could be looking at something in their lap. Like it could be anything. So you're not on a full red alert yet, but you're definitely going to investigate. So first things first, you do that quick safety sweep that we just talked about, a super quick visual search around the person you think is being poisoned, looking for sharps, looking for distressed community members, looking for all of those things that we talked about. The other thing you're going to keep your eye out for um, could be potentially like their kit and their kits comprised of tools and substances that they'll use to get high. So things like cookers, lighters, creme brulee torches, tourniquets, makeshift tourniquets, that kind of stuff. Again, just looking for this because finding this could give EMS a better idea of what that person was using when they arrive. Once you've done this check, that's when you approach the community member and you begin these steps with stimulate the casualty. So you're going to start off with verbal stimulation trying to get their attention with your voice. As you're doing this, you're going to put on your gloves. That just buys you a little bit of extra time in case they happen to rip before you need to physically interact with the person. But we're starting with verbal stimulation. You're gonna shout their name if you know it, say what you wanna say to see if they'll wake up. Um, if they're at a table, you can smack the table. If they're at the ground, you can smack the ground near their face. You're just trying to wake them up with noise. I will mention sometimes if you catch that person um, in that semi-conscious state or they're doing that heavy nod, right, where they're drifting in and out of consciousness, um, by keeping them engaged in conversation or that continued auditory stimulation, you might be able to delay unconsciousness and therefore the need to administer naloxone until emergency services arrive. So it's definitely worthwhile to start here. If they haven't responded to any of that, you're going to move to physical stimulation as that next step, right? So your gloves should already be on at this point. Coming from a harm reduction lens, it is important to walk them through everything you're about to do out loud, even if they're unconscious. But again, you're trying to wake them up physically now. So you could start with their foot or their boot by kicking their foot or their boot. That's kind of a way to physically stimulate them without getting too much into their personal space, right? Other options, you could squeeze their triceps, right? You could pinch their traps. Um, you could take your knuckles and rub them into the collarbone there. We now recommend the collarbone instead of the sternum rump. So just a quick note in case um, you haven't done CP or first aid recently, we recommend the collarbone instead of the sternum now, just because the sternum can sometimes put that person at risk for a heart arrhythmia. So we stick with the collarbone, rub your knuckles into there. If they haven't responded to that, then you have an unconscious, unresponsive person on your hands. Your next step is to call 911 or your local emergency services. So um, calling 911, if you have someone helping you, they can take point on the call while you take point on the rescue. Otherwise, you're going to use your speakerphone um, and you can just put it on the ground beside you and talk to the person that way. Uh, essentially, what you're going to do here is you're going to tell the dispatcher first and foremost exactly where you are and give them as much information, as much detail as possible so that they can find you quickly. So where are you in the building, right? Do you have to go up a set of stairs? Are you on the east wing, the west wing? Um, if you're outside, what are some landmarks around that can help them find you quickly? 
You're also going to describe the visible signs and symptoms that you're hearing and any sounds that you're seeing and any sounds that you're hearing. So for example, you know, I can see that they're not breathing and their lips are turning gray, right? They're non-responsive and they're making a gurgling sound, right? Just clear in what you're seeing and hearing. We do not want to try to identify any of the drugs that you see present on the scene um, just because you don't know for sure what they are. You don't know what they contain. Um, we don't want to make any judgments here. We're just sticking to the facts. Um, and then finally, you can tell them that you suspect a poisoning, that you have a naloxone kit and where you are in the process of administering that naloxone, right? So have you administered naloxone yet? Did you just discover the person? Have you begun CPR? That kind of stuff. Um, Essentially here, this will provide the dispatcher the information that they need to help you through the process of the rescue, especially if panic sets in and you can't remember the save me steps. If you give them the information that they need, the 911 dispatcher is there to help you through the process um, and and they can stay on the line with you that way if you ask. OK. Um, one last thing to mention is just just as it's important not to use stigmatizing terms in our day to day life, our language in these scenarios is also really important, right? So try to avoid any stigmatizing terms or words that are going to really set a negative tone to the to the rescue response. So words like drugs, hostile, aggressive, anything along those lines when speaking to a 911 dispatcher, as that could um that could potentially trigger a police response before a medical response. And we don't want that, right? Depending on the location, um, police may very well be the first people to arrive on the scene. Uh, we just want to encourage that really compassionate medical response and understand too that often many community members might feel less safe when they are approached by the police. Um, there are again many studies on that as well. So that can sometimes escalate the situation and, and can have implications in the poisoning response or medical emergencies. So we want to be aware of that and we want to be careful with our language so that there is just you know, no one arriving on the scene already kind of on the defense or, um, you know, potentially escalating the scenario. And then finally, also when we're talking about scenarios escalating like this, we also just have to recognize that interactions between even EMS persons and community members may also at times lead to strife just due to there being like an alarming amount of stressors uh, being experienced on each side, right? So on the one hand, uh, our community members often facing, you know, stigma and discrimination. And on the other side of things, EMS staff often, you know, experiencing, you know, crazy amounts of burnout, um, you know, long hours, lack of pay, that kind of stuff. So understanding both perspectives and a focus on compassion and empathy can really help to ensure that supportive rescue environment. But we just want to be aware that there could sometimes potentially be um, some frictions and we want to just always advocate for that supportive environment. So we have uh, stimulated the person and then we've activated EMS. OK, so that answers your question, Katie. We want to activate EMS first and then we're going to get into the remaining save me steps. So let's get into airway. Um, so essentially here, that's the next step. You're going to try and get them onto the ground and onto their back. Like I said, you're going to make an initial evaluation and check their breathing. So regular respiration is one breath every five or seconds or so. Anything much longer than that, like if it's one breath every 10 to 15 seconds if the breath is sounding really labored or really shallow right that person's having trouble getting the oxygen that they need right um, after checking that we're going to open their airway so you're going to tilt their head back with one hand and pull their chin down with the other and then if the person is not breathing or if their breathing is very labored or shallow as it will be um in an opioid poisoning scenario, you're going to begin uh, to ventilate, which is our next step. So first I'm going to show you how to actually um, place the face barrier on their face super quickly. So this is something that you will need, like if you know the person and you're comfortable with it, um, you don't have to use this, but this is good to use um, just in terms of PPE. So you can see there um, this face barrier comes in your kit. It's got a picture that shows how it's meant to go on the face, where your hands need to be, and then that white circle goes onto their mouth. It's also at the bottom. It says rescue aid, so you want to make sure that you can read that, and that's how you know it's facing the right way up. So after you place this face barrier on their face, that's when you're going to open their airway. So tilt their chin back, tilt their head back, pull their chin down, 
Pinch their nose with your free hand and then you move into the ventilate step. So that's where you're going to deliver one breath every five seconds, making sure you see the chest rise and you're going to do that for five breaths total. And you're doing that before you administer the naloxone on them. And essentially you're doing that because that person needs oxygen even before it, they need naloxone, right? They're already in that oxygen deprived state and naloxone is going to take about two to three minutes to kick in. So they really need for you to breathe for them in the meantime, and they need that oxygen right away. So we start with those five big breaths, even before the naloxone. Um, oh, hold on one second. Something happened here. Okay. OK, we're back. That was weird. Everything just shrunk away. Um, so super quickly, I'm just going to mention um, our, our kind of COVID disclaimer there. So St. John Amounts has taken the stance that CPR and in COVID environment remains unchanged. So um, it's our recommendation that you breathe for them, that this ventilation and ventilation during the CPR step as well is a crucial and life-saving step to this emergency. Um, we know that COVID-19 virus is transmitted through droplets that come out of the respiratory system, so we recommend, we recommend using as much PPE as is available to protect both yourself and that person, and that includes the face shield that comes in your kit, which I just showed you how to use, okay? So this is, again, our best practice includes ventilation. Um, okay, so we've done those five big breaths. Again, one breath every five seconds for five breaths. Um, you're going to move to the next step, which is evaluate. And this is just a super quick check. Determine whether the breathing's helping. Did that kickstart their own breathing again? Um, if not, you're going to move on to the next step, which is M. Medicaid. So here's where, remember, we're going to, like I showed you before, peel the package back. Remove the device. I'll spotlight myself again here. Awesome. Hold it with your thumb on the bottom of the plunger, two fingers on the nozzle, just like that. You're going to tilt the person's head back, place and hold the tip of the nozzle, just like I showed you, into the nostril. Press up until your fingers touch the bottom of the person's nose, and then press that red plunger firmly and release the full dose into the person's nose. Okay. So that is our Medicaid step, standing for M. And then after that, we move to E, which is evaluate. Uh, before we get into that last E step, let me just show you our video with our program partner, Mark Barnes. So he's just going to show us how to unpack and administer that naloxone um, one more time. Again, just so you have that visual. So I'll make sure the sound's on. Play that here. Hi, I'm Mark Barnes, pharmacist and founder of
Okay, thank you, Mark. Okay, so after we go through everything Mark just covered, we're landing on our last step, which remember is E. We're going to evaluate again, looking for the signs that the naloxone's working. So after you administer that naloxone, um, you're going to go into CPR for the next two to three minutes. Um, after two to three minutes, if there are no signs of improvement, like I said, you're going to deliver the next dose into the opposite nostril and then resume P CPR. And that's the cycle that you're going to continue until you see the signs that the naloxone's working or EMS arrives. So the signs that you're looking for that the naloxone's working is that, you know, their pupils return back to a regular size, color comes back to the skin, breathing rate increases, the person starts to wake up. So that's usually one of the biggest tells. But again, remember, if you're managing an atypical poisoning, um, they won't wake up, but they will start breathing again. Um, or they may begin to experience those withdrawal symptoms as well that we've talked about. OK, so those are signs you're looking out for and you're going to continue that cycle until you see those signs of improvement. Um, OK, so that takes us to just our quick review here. OK, so we just went through each step in, in quite a bit of detail. So let's look at the save me steps in their entirety one last time. Right. We've got S. Remember, so we'll shout, squeeze and activate EMS. Then we move to A, we're going to open the airway, place the face barrier on their face. V, ventilate, deliver one breath every five seconds, ensuring the chest rises for five breaths total. E, evaluate, are these steps helping? M, medication, prepare and deliver a dose of naloxone if available and you're trained, and then provide CPR for the next two to three minutes. And then E, evaluate. Did the naloxone help? You should see improvement within two to three minutes. If there's no improvement after that two to three minutes, remember we administer another dose and go back to that CPR. OK, so I know in walking through um, all of those steps, it seems like this might take a while to get through this process, but in an active rescue, this is actually all going to happen super, super quickly. Um, it's just like boom, boom, boom. Um, so again, that's why you want to try and memorize these steps so that you can move at that fast pace that you need to. Um, so are there any new are there not new? Are there any questions? Is that clear for everyone in terms of the steps to follow, how to administer, um, you know, complications to consider? Is there anything I can help anyone with so far before we dive into the last portion of our training? OK, looks like we're good. Um, for adults, do you block the opposite nostril when administering? Yeah, Katie, so good question. Um, I did say you do that for children. For adults, it's not strictly necessary, I've been told, but it can be helpful. So maybe I would recommend that just in case. Um, the reason it might be helpful is just if they're if they have been using substances like snorting stuff and it can impact the inside of the nose. And someone shared with me the other day that sometimes they do that just in case so that it doesn't fall out the other side of the nose if that inner part of your nose is um, compromised. So yeah, block the opposite nostril. Any other questions? Yeah, no problem. OK, good. So now that you are armed with this training, you are encouraged to carry a kit with you at all times. So we have talked about the fact that anyone might be at risk of an opioid poisoning and you never know when you might need to step in and save a life. So you will be receiving a kit for your participation in this training, um, a nasal naloxone kit. However, you can also obtain free naloxone kits from designated pharmacies and community organizations across the country. So what you want to do is you want to call up uh, your local pharmacy if you're going to get it from the pharmacy and double check first if they have them available and also what type they offer. So if they're carrying IM or nasal naloxone, depending on where you're located, the IM version, so the intramuscular, the needle version is, is likely to be what you're going to receive. It's much more readily available at the moment. But call to see what they have and that they do have some in stock before you go. Um, your local public health unit or pharmacist will be able to provide more training on how to administer the IM naloxone as well, if that's all that they have, if that's all that they have. Um, and then you could also check in with your local harm reduction networks as well. They're always a great resource in terms of accessing naloxone and training as well. OK, so um, let's get into our last module here, which is the self-care plan.
Um, and so hopefully at the end of this module, you're going to be able to recognize um, post emergency personal trauma to be able to identify a peak moment and also identify the components of the self care plan so that you can build one out for yourself. So um, this is an important portion of our training. Like I said, we're going to have a discussion on self care and how we really take care of ourselves and our mental health as a rescuer after managing an emergency like this. Um, it's important that we recognize that managing an opioid poisoning emergency, it can be, like I mentioned, an incredibly traumatic event. And that's whether this is your first time, whether you've done this well over 50 times, and also regardless of the outcome. And so while um, this is certainly a difficult experience for, you know, the person experiencing the poisoning to go through, the stress and the trauma of managing an emergency like this can also have a negative lasting impact on you as well. So that's what we're going to talk about now let's talk about that and as well as some tools that we can take with us after this training today to really help guide us through the aftermath so it's fair to assume that after an experience like this you will be changed and i want you to remember that you don't have to deal with this alone that you will get through it and you know it's okay to not be okay if that's how you're feeling we just really if possible try and be kind to yourself here so some best practices in your organization um, that you might already have in place, but we can list for you here anyways, um, and I highly recommend. If you have any other tips and, and um, suggestions in terms of best practices after managing an event like this, feel free to type them into the chat too. This is where we can really come together as a, as a community and share our, our thoughts and our ideas, and then I'll list out some for you here as well that we've identified. So. First would be um, an employment assistance program. So if you have one available to you, take some time to get to know what's offered. If there's some counseling available, take advantage of those programs, right? You're already contributing to them. So it's about understanding what it offers and then making the time to use it can sometimes be the hardest part, but the EAP can be helpful in these scenarios. Um, another good strategy to have in place is debriefing, right? So um, whether that is, you know, if you're working within an environment where confidentiality is important, you can debrief with your coworkers, your managers, or, you know, sometimes if you're, you know, working outside of that that um, area, like not on the front lines, just talking things through with somebody who gets it can be really, really helpful. Um, so debriefing can be a really important practice after managing an emergency like this. We also identified space because sometimes you just, depending on the person, right, we need a little space and time to integrate our experience. Um, and then finally, we identified community there, right? And this is an important one because we all have people who care about us and who want to support us. And accepting love and support from our loved ones can be one of the most impactful things that we can do, right? But it absolutely does come with its own set of challenges. So we would, you know, it would, not be useful to just ignore those challenges as well. So the challenges is that on the one hand, it can be incredibly, incredibly difficult to ask for help and accept help, right? I resonate with that so much, whether that's a matter of you not wanting to be a burden maybe, or you know, maybe you not having the language or the self-awareness or even the energy, right, to explain and understand what you're going through. That can be really, really hard. And then on the other side of things too, your loved ones, they might want to help you but they have no idea how, right? They don't know what you've been through. They don't know what you need. And that can be incredibly frustrating on their end as well. But all is not lost, okay? There is something that we can do to help lessen some of those barriers, right? We can be proactive about our self-care and our mental health. Um, and we do that by creating a self-care plan. So what is a self-care plan? Just consider it like a guide or a roadmap that can help guide you back to a place where you want to be mentally and emotionally after managing um, the uh, an experience of a trauma or um, an opioid poisoning event. So this self-care plan is a guide that's going to help you recognize when you're upset. It's going to help you understand things that you can do to support yourself and things that you're hoping to avoid. And this is for you and it's also for your support network so that you all have the tools that you need to help get you back on your feet again. And you have them prior to an emergency occurring um, so that that is kind of in your back pocket as a tool to use in the aftermath of managing an emergency. 
So that's what we're going to look at how to build in the last section of our training today. We're going to focus more so on the how, right? How we're going to build one. And then you have all the materials that you need in your handout to go off after this training and do it yourself. And I highly, highly recommend that you do. So first um, in constructing this self care plan, we're going to go through a little bit of pre work. So that will include the peak moment exercise and the peak moment workflow. And then once we're done with that, we're going to take a look at how to actually build the self care plan and the questions that you need to ask yourself. So let's dig into that now. So um, Again, you're going to try and do these exercises before a crisis happens, right? So you want to be in a relatively, um, you know, calm state when you're moving through this exercise. Um, we're starting, like I said, off with the peak moment exercise, and it's, it's actually pretty simple. All you're going to do for it, as the title suggests, is I want you to think about a peak moment in your life. So, for example, you could think back to a time where you overcame or accomplished something you were really proud of, right? Or a cherished moment with friends and family or whatever it is. It is right but i want you to think about that moment and then share it either with a friend or to yourself on a recording and as you're sharing it i want you to be as detailed as you can in your descriptions and really begin thinking about all of the things that you had been feeling during that time as well as what it took to get there and all the downstream effects that that moment had in your life um just talk about it as much as you possibly can and and really start to identify what you were feeling during that time and that's really the main objective here is to get you really clear on your peak moment, as well as all of the things you were feeling during your peak moment, all the emotions and adjectives and verbs that you're using to describe it. So for example, did you feel accomplished, right? Did you feel happy? Did you feel purpose? Did you feel acknowledged? Did you feel connected, right? If you're going through this exercise with a friend, what they're going to do is they're going to listen to you telling the story of your peak moment, and they're going to write down all of the important emotions and adjectives that you're using in your description. They're going to write them down, and then they're going to share them with you. And if you're doing this exercise on your own, you are going to record yourself sharing your peak moment, and then listen to that recording and act as your own listener afterwards, right? So you're going to listen to yourself speak on that recording, and just down all the key emotions that you hear yourself talking about, adjectives, all of that. Um, and you're going to take that list, whether it was one that you gathered or one that your friend shared after listening to your peak moment. Um, and we're going to use that list of key emotions in our next exercise, which is the peak moment workflow. Um, essentially, for this peak moment exercise, we're using this as a way to identify and acknowledge a time where you felt good, right? We want to help us I get really clear on what we want to feel like when we're out of crisis. So you can consider this peak moment exercise kind of like your mental, you know, North Star. Ideally, remembering this moment will also help bring us back to a place of feeling safer as well in the memory of it so that we can begin to process what we've experienced after a crisis. While we, not, we, we may not feel the exact same way that we did in this peak moment, just in doing this exercise, we might not feel the exact same way as we did then. That's okay. We can still use this moment as our guide and our anchor through these challenging times, right? To remember what it was like to feel good. Next, like I said, we're going to use the information we gathered in our peak moment exercise to create this peak moment workflow. OK, so this workflow is going to help us determine actions that we can take to get back to or close to the emotional state of our peak moment, and it will break down like this. So we've already identified our peak moment. After that, we're going to take a step back from each um, from our peak moment and list out all of the emotions that you've already cataloged from your peak moment exercise that were a part of your peak moment, right? So you're going to put that in the emotions column there. Obviously, your chart is going to look completely different from this one here. This is just an example, OK? After doing that, we're going to take a step back from each individual emotion. We're going to list some uh, reactions or evidence or indicators that help us recognize that we're feeling that emotion, right? So for example, um, I know I am feeling happy when I when I am laughing, right? I know the experience of touch also makes me feel happy or when I'm listening to music, 
it helps me to feel happy. It generates that feeling for me. It's an indicator. And then finally, in the last list there, we're going to take a step back from each of the pieces of evidence or the indicators that we listed, and we're going to list a few actions we can take to kind of make those reactions or that evidence happen, right? So you want these actions to be um, something that can be accomplished relatively easily, right? I know that like going on a beach vacation, of course, also makes me happy, but that's not something I can accomplish in my day to day. So what can I accomplish in my day to day that's going to help to generate those those emotions? So moving forward with the example I just gave, right from the peak moment, one thing I identified was feeling happy, right? Like I had said, an indicator for me that I'm feeling happy is laughter. So then I take it a step further and think, OK, what is an action I can take to help me generate laughter in my body, right? And so something I came up with was, you know, inside jokes, calling a friend for that inside joke or um, maybe watching Shit's Creek, right? So at the end, you can see how we've kind of reversed engineered back for that emotional state, right? At the end of this workflow, we're landing on a big list of actions that then created the reactions that then generated the emotions that were a part of that peak moment. So reverse engineering back for that emotional state, like I said. The intention of the peak moment and the peak moment workflow is certainly not to resolve the feeling of um, the feelings surrounding a traumatic experience of an opioid poisoning or potential fatality. Um, so please don't think that that's what we're trying to do. Rather, the intention is just to provide you again, like I said, of an example of what it's feel what it's like to feel good and a foundation to build out the components of your self care plan with that actions list. OK. So having done the pre-work of the peak moment exercise along with the peak moment workflow, we have a better sense of two things, right? We have a better sense of how we want to feel and we have a better sense of small steps we can take to get there. But I really want to stress that you do not have to do all of this alone. So this is really where the support of your loved ones is going to come in because we need them to help us with these things. Um, so how do we get them to help us? Essentially, we do that by building them a self-care plan. So I do know that there's two moment, two minutes left in class. So if you have to hop off right at the hour mark, no worries. Um, again, this is in your handout, the questions you need to build out your self-care plan. Um, but if you are able to stick around, I will need five minutes or less of your time, then I would love to have you too. So I completely understand you have to go, but if you can stick around for five minutes, I would love to have you. Okay. So let's take a look at that self care plan now. So this is a simple document. It can fit on your cue card. It can fit on the lock screen of your phone, whatever you have. As you can see, the plan contains six components. Um, which really require it's like six questions, right? And they require you to be as open and as honest and as vulnerable as you can be. So these six questions are going to really help you to establish um, landmarks that you and your support network will use to guide you back to a place of safe recovery. So here's how you build out your plan. So you're going to make a list to start off with of all the physical and emotional behaviors that let you recognize when you're upset. So for example, right, do you grind your teeth? Um, do you get really irritable? Do you tend to withdraw and isolate yourself, right? What are those signs for you? Because identifying these tells, right, that allows your support network to recognize that you're upset so they don't have to ask you if you're okay and you don't have to answer with like that standard, yeah, I'm fine, right? They already know that you're not. So that takes that out of the equation. After that, you're going to make a list of what you can you do when you're upset that would be good for you. So here's where you're going to use that peak moment workflow, right? You're going to go back to that far right section, the actions list, and plug some things from that into here. After that, you're going to make a list of people you can contact if you need support. So again, you really want to be intentional with who you select and really understand that, you know, we get different things from different people and that's OK, right? Who listens with empathy in your life and without interrupting, right? Or who can you call that you know they're great at like coming over for company when you're feeling lonely or anxious? Or who do you know makes you laugh? You want to write those people down there and identify who you're going to reach out to. After that, you're going to make a list of positive things to say to yourself when you're giving yourself a hard time. So this is just a tiny step in the direction of counteracting negative self-talk. It does require a certain amount of self-awareness, so it can be kind of challenging because 
First, you have to recognize the negative dialogue going on in your head, and we all have it, right? Um, but then you want to recognize that and then reverse the narrative on it, right? So for example, um, you know, if you have some version of like, I am not enough, I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, whatever it is in your head, you're going to reverse the narrative on that and, and, you know, replace it with, you know, I have all that I need or, um, you know, I... I am smart enough or whatever it is, um, but reversing the narrative on it. And this is going to be helpful both for you in terms of recognizing positive affirmations that you can say to yourself, but it's also going to be helpful for your support network because they know what to listen out for in terms of you getting down on yourself and they know how to support you with a more positive affirmation. And then after that, you're going to make a list of who and what to avoid when you're having a hard time. OK, so this is all about identifying any self-sabotaging behaviors that you want to avoid, as well as identifying people who you know won't be able to offer you the support that you're looking for. Right. For example, a friend that makes things all about them when you're trying to share. Right. Or maybe a parent that tells you like, oh, just get over it or just try harder or stuff like that. Right. Not who you need in that moment of um, needing support. And then finally, who do you want supporting you with this plan? And it might be the people that you've already identified and it might be completely different people, but you wanna select a few trusted members of your support network and share this plan with them. So again, they have the tools that they need to take care of you. Love your this, like I just said, because with this guide, both you and your support network will be able to recognize first when you're upset, they'll be able to know things or actions they can do to support you. They also know how to support you in avoiding what you need to avoid in that time. Um, so again, this plan is all about all about being proactive about self-care, right? And letting those who love you have the tools that they need to take care of you. Remember too that this plan, um, it's not intended to replace any more intensive forms of therapy. It's intended to support you through the aftermath of a crisis until you have the opportunity to, to get to those more um, intensive forms of therapy should that be needed, right? So you wanna use this plan um, or using this plan effectively, it's gonna take time and it's gonna take practice. It's also gonna take a little humility if you're gonna get the most out of letting the people who love you take care of you but you are so, so, so worth it. So um, we just really encourage you to kind of take this on. If you have any questions about this plan, about creating this plan, please reach out to us. Um, we are happy to provide you with that support. You know, being happy is not about making sure everything in life is great 24 seven. That's not really realistic. Um, but it can be about seeing a little bit of good in each day. And so a plan like this can can hopefully help you a little bit on that journey. And then finally, um, in discussions on mental health, let's just take one last slide for you to, you know, write down any numbers that you need to write down, um, any names of organizations that you need to write down. It's just really important that you unburden yourself and you talk to someone, whether that is a trusted friend, a counselor, or one of the resources listed on this slide here. Um, and again, if you know any other good national mental health resources, feel, feel free to list them in the chat as well. Okay. So um, I believe that that is all. What I will do now is um, welcome your questions. Um, I want to thank you as well, like I did before, in terms of like, thank you so much for your time, for your attention. Thank you for, you know, sharing your thoughtful perspectives on stigma um, and being a part of the conversation today. I really appreciated it. Um, we have this post training survey up on the slides, which I would appreciate just like we did at the beginning for you to fill out now. Um, so I'll leave this up here. And then beyond that, I am absolutely here um, as long as you need me here to, to discuss any questions. If you have any anything you want to chat about, um, feel free to let me know and we can we can talk about that now. So anything I can clear up for anybody. All right. Doesn't look like it. Thanks, Addison. OK, well, um, of course, I'm going to stop the recording.